chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. That's the second book of the Bible, right after Genesis. For you that are smiling because you already know that, well, nobody knows everything, and a lot of people don't know that, so don't be a smart hot. Right. <laughs> Exodus chapter 12. <laughs> In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. And our monthly calendar this year uh, coordinates with that, if you'll notice. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. Ye shall eat nothing leavened, and all your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that's in the basin and strike the lentil on the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lentil and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service, and it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as Moses as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. So Father, please help this evening our understanding as well, God, as the attitude of our hearts toward the very, very grave situation of judgment and of being spared from judgment. I pray that it be both a sobering as well as impactful service this evening because of the truth that we see, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus is our Passover. When Jesus entered Jerusalem on what is called Palm Sunday because of the laying down of palm fronds to make His way like that of a king, Jesus was entering Jerusalem for the Passover in order to be the Passover. There's a lot to think on when you consider that Jesus is our Passover. Because Jesus is the Passover Lamb. I don't know how many we have here who uh, are, are non citified folk, but for the most part, y'all are fairly civilized. And so some of the pictures that are here are more, I think, from a perspective of one who has seen things in films than one who has seen things in person. We don't need it this evening, but it could perhaps be helpful to have a 4D theater in order to illustrate the Passover tonight. If we were this evening to show the procedure of on the certain day taking a lamb and separating it from the other goats and from the other animals in preparation for the Passover, making sure that it's an unblemished lamb and that it is kept separated, for those days until the killing of the lamb and illustrate each day and show the feeding of it and show the care of it. And then that's where the 4D theater would come in for may, to, to really help us with impact because then we would have the sacrifice or the slaughtering part of the lamb. I don't know if you've ever seen an animal killed. A lot of folks have never seen an animal killed. Maybe you've seen one die. It bothers me to see roadkill. It, it troubles me a little bit. But when we see in our context the preparing of the Passover for the purpose of making the children say, what meaneth this? 
That's the impact of it. Now, I understand that this would have been an agricultural society. But you know, killing sheep didn't happen every day. Sheep weren't kept for meat. Sheep were kept for wool. And they were kept because they were valuable. They were a valuable animal to eat because they were more valuable for what they produced than what you ate them for. Uh, sometimes, too, we think, well, I was back in the day where people were just butchers. They had no empathy, and they just didn't love animals and so forth. No, you know, I think that one of the things that flies in the face of that would be when Nathan the prophet came to David and illustrated the man who had the pet lamb that he loved when his neighbor stole it and ate it instead of his many lambs that he had. We see from the Scripture that, that wasn't so. We also know uh, that a righteous man regards the life of his beast is what Solomon taught. So though there may have been brutish persons in the day who did not care about the wanton taking of animal life, the truth of the matter is that it was something which was done uh, not happily, but with careful consideration, and it was bothersome and troublesome. It was even more troublesome, perhaps, because of the separation that had to take place. You had to select the best of the flock, a firstborn lamb who was without blemish. So you had to take the best. Now that is different than what you would normally do. Normally when a sheep is aging out, that's when you would consider that perhaps it's more valuable for me than for the wool that it produces because it may die and be worth nothing, and so then perhaps you would take it when it's not at its best. Other reasons for that would be that you would take an animal that would be less likely to survive hardship and so I'd, the, the healthiest and the most unblemished of animals would be the ones that you would spare, not the ones which you would take the life of. And so a lot of those things don't naturally occur to us because we don't go out every day and kill our food normally. We usually pick it up at the supermarket or something like that. But for folks in a more agricultural society, uh, this would be something that would have a, perhaps more of an impact. And I don't mean to be crude this evening at all, but it wouldn't hurt us just to have a little bit of the fourth dimension of things, and that is when there's a slaughter of an animal, the smells that come along with it, the kind of things that the first time that you see turn the stomach and make one sick. The sight of blood, which for many individuals, whether it's human or whether it is animal blood, makes us oftentimes cringe, or for some people makes us a little bit faint or to even pass out. I remember the first time that I went hunting with my father, I was excited about going in the woods and you know, hunting a deer and doing the things that I'd read about in books and heard about from hunters, but it was a different thing altogether the first time I came down the trail and found the wounded deer laying there and bleeding out. It was, it was something different the first time that we had to dress it, field dress it, and take out the bowels of it and the smells that instantly come out of it and the warm, sick smell of blood as it's shed and as it's pouring out on the ground is something that makes you want to vomit. You say, Pastor, it's crude this evening. I didn't come for something crude. No, friend, it's good for us to recognize that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sin. But it's a good thing for us to realize that the shedding of blood is not something that is done haphazardly or carelessly in any, in any uh, aspect or by any means. Certainly not the shedding of the lifeblood of a person. When you read the law, which spells out and lays out the consequences even for individuals who have shed blood and for whom the death penalty is prescribed, you see that it is done with much care and consideration. Uh, you're not able to have a single witness swear to the hurt of another individual. There must be two or three witnesses that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established because it's a serious matter. There are means for individuals who have committed manslaughter and who have accidentally shed the blood of man or have accidentally uh, killed a man to grab a hold of the horns of an altar and to have mercy and to abide by certain rules and restrictions that would allow their lives to be spared because the shedding of blood, particularly of a person, is a serious matter to God. And so when the Scripture talks about this description of the Passover and of taking a precious lamb, taking an unblemished lamb, taking a spotless lamb, setting it apart and preparing it, and then slaughtering it. It's to make the children say, why did we do this? Why did we do this? Why did this have to happen? But it's not humorous. It's, there's no comedy in it. It's a serious matter. 
And the reason for it we saw from our context this evening was to illustrate that by the Passover lamb, the children of Israel in Egypt were spared the same death that came upon the household of the Egyptian by the avenger or by the slayer. An avenger is one who executes or exacts judgment on those who deserve it. And so we're reminded from the picture that we deserve death, but we were passed over for death because of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Now today, Easter, the first Sunday of the month, the first Sunday, uh, or the first day of the Pass after the Passover, we're reminded of the triumph of the resurrection. And I'm glad we have that picture. I'm glad we have the completed picture. But fellowship does not come with little cost. Fellowship with God and fellowship with one another comes at great cost, at great sacrifice. A sacrifice and a cost which God paid for and which God's Son <clears throat> laid down His life for. And so it is a sobering, serious moment when we partake of the Passover. The night in which Jesus was betrayed is described in Matthew chapter 26. And in that passage of Scripture, before Jesus was betrayed, He had handed this up to Judas and said, That thou doest, go do quickly. And Judas went out to betray the Lord Jesus. After that, Jesus began the Lord's Supper. Went through the aspects of the Lord's Supper. And after that, when they'd sung in Him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. I want to go this evening as well and look at it more from our perspective, which would be 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you'll find your place there, most of you are very familiar with this passage of Scripture. But 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is more of a perspective for people who were not there or who did, were not eyewitnesses of what happened the night Jesus was betrayed. It is written by the help of the Holy Spirit with an individual qualified to help us with this same perspective because he was not there himself. This would be the Apostle Paul. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 11 then would be by the power of the Holy Spirit and prompting of the Holy Spirit a, uh, a collection or a thought given by the Apostle Paul, which would be something that he had researched and studied for himself and really had thought through as well as been convicted by the Holy Ghost about himself. And so we will begin in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 looking at the portion where the warning is given that the believers, it is possible for believers when they assemble, to assemble not for better but for worse. Literally when the body comes together, the end result is that they have done things which have made it so that they are worse off than if they uh, than if they had not even uh, come together. Please see with me down in verse 17 of chapter 11. Now in this I declare unto you, I praise that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it, for there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. And that's a scary statement in and of itself, if you'll study it. Because how is it that an individual would be approved when there are heresies or differing beliefs among the believers? How is it that individuals would stand as approved in the body? I believe it's they survive. I believe it's that they survive. Uh, as Christians, you have to be careful with the mentality of, oh, something bad happened in their life, so they must have done something bad. But do you know that the Bible teaches about false teachers and about false doctrine, that by their fruit ye shall know them? And the fruit of false doctrine, ultimately, is that <coughs> God deals with it. And God's judgment comes upon it. You and I had better be afraid of formulating an opinion on the basis of our preference or our pride, which is oftentimes where false doctrine comes from. <coughs> Individuals not willing to come to a place where they recognize that they're wrong about something, and so they take a galvanized, hardened position where they are unwilling to consider whether they're wrong, and they're willing even to affect others to their cause so that they can be validated by the numbers which they can gather to follow them. And listen, it's the, the, just having people agree with you doesn't make you right. 
agreeing with the Word of God is what makes you right about a thing. And the Bible teaches here that there are individuals, there's going to be heresies, but there are also going to be uh, an approval. That is, God's going to, in the end, He's going to sort it all out. And as we begin to read down into our context, we'll see ultimately that when it's sorted out, it's that the end result is that some people are sickly and some people die. So, I will say this evening that along with it being a sober matter of the Passover, it is so sober that the unworthy partaking of the Passover can result in sickness or death. And so let's go ahead and be as sober during this moment as we can because it is a serious matter. And he said in verse 20, But I say unto you that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading verse 10. That's not what I wanted to do. Uh, in verse 20, uh, for there, or when you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. And so Paul first emphasizes that the purpose of the Lord's Supper is not for us to be exalted. Uh, it's not for us to shame other people, and it's not for us to take a meal or to prefer ourselves before someone else. And so it's not a matter of rank or importance. And here I can visualize a little bit what James describes when he talks about God not being a respecter of persons. He talks about if one comes into you or among you in goodly raiment, you say sit here or sit there, and then someone comes in and and they're in more evil raiment or not as nice a clothing and they're not as well to do, and you say, stand thou there or sit under my footstool. And there's a preference of persons even in the partaking of the Lord's Supper. We don't want that. The Lord's Supper is all about having the servant attitude or mindset which puts or esteems everyone better than oneself. And that was not what was being done. The Lord's Supper seems to have devolved into a meal in which individuals were preferred one before another, and that's wrong. In verse 21, uh, in, I keep reading the wrong passage, but in verse 21, the Bible says, For in eating, everyone taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry, one is, and another is drunken. Now go down to verse 23. And Paul explains what the Lord's Supper is. It is not a meal, and it is not something which is to exalt a person and abase another. Verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which He was betrayed took bread. And when He had given thanks, He brake it and said, Take, eat. This is My body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of Me. And after verse 25, After the same manner also He took the cup when He had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in My blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. Now that phrase, as oft as you drink it, is one that bears some consideration. Uh, it, it appears that there is liberty in the phrase, as oft as you eat it. We do see precedent in the book of Acts that in, individuals daily from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. And I do believe that that phrase which emphasizes eating is different than simply the uh, gathering together. I think personally, and I don't have I don't have proof of this, nor does anyone have proof otherwise, but I think personally that perhaps the Lord's Supper would have been observed uh, on the first day of the week, perhaps. And that seems to be when the fellowship and the assembling was supposed to take place. It would seem to me that it would uh, be rather unreasonable to have it every evening for the reason, or even every time that believers met, for the reason of excluding some of the brethren in the fellowship. But those are just reasons I don't know. What I do know is that the Scripture gives a grand, great deal of permission in the phrase, as oft as ye eat it. I also know that the day that Jesus took or partook of the Lord's Supper was on the Passover. And so, this being the season of the Passover, I think that the precedent is very well set that at least at this time of the year it ought to be something that we do or that we participate in. Certainly for Christians, days 
that we celebrate the works of God in mighty ways and we remember God's work would be appropriate. And there's no time when believers look back and remember the completed work of the, Christ, of the cross as well as the Passover more so than on Easter or Resurrection Sunday. And I think for that we'd all be in agreement, wouldn't we? And so we, as we continue on in our context this evening, uh, we see in verse 26, as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till He come. And here's a reminder that even on a day in which we celebrate the resurrection, that the death of Jesus Christ needs to be remembered. Without death, the resurrection has no meaning. And without remembering the death of Christ, the sacrifice of the cross and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ living a sinless life has no meaning. Consider, if you will, for yourself what Jesus Christ went through in humbling Himself to take upon the form of a servant, if you will, please. It's a big deal that God came down from heaven to, to be on this earth and to lower Himself and become the servant of sinful men. Even had Jesus not gone to the cross, and of course I'm not entertaining that hypothetical, but even had Jesus not gone to the cross, coming to earth for the Son of God was a big deal. It was a lowering of Himself to come and be among sinners. Furthermore, for Jesus Christ to endure the temptation of sinners was a lowering of Himself. Friend, consider, again, consider that the Satan is not a rival of God. And to even allow the 40 days in the wilderness situation to take place is only done for the benefit of mankind, not because of anything that was necessary in and of Himself for Jesus Christ. To live on this earth without a home, to live on this earth without recognition, without the rights that he had, not just as a king. See, we think in terms, as humans, we think in terms of human monarchy. And we think that a king is something. But friend, humanly speaking, a king is nothing compared to God. King, God. There's no comparison between a ruler of men and the creator of men. And so Jesus Christ's coming was a big deal. And it was a greater deal even further that Jesus Christ came and lived a sinless life so that He could be the spotless Lamb without blemish. And it is absolutely incredible that He went through with being obedient to the will of the Father. You say, Pastor, but Jesus was God's perfect Son. He would do everything perfectly. You can't relate to that. And so for you and I, that's incredible. You can't relate to being an obedient child. You're the disobedient child that needed Jesus Christ's sacrifice for. You say, Pastor, that's me. Well, let's just put it in the first person then. I can't relate to being the obedient child. We can't relate to being the obedient child. And any person who thinks they can, thinks rather highly of themselves. But I don't think so highly of you, so come down off your high horse, okay? <laughs> Moving forward. Don't take that personally. I'm kidding with you this evening. A little bit. Verse 27, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Just as a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, just as the slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, just as the example of the sacrifice and the taking of the hyssop and painting of the blood over the doorpost of the house was a vivid picture of as a, it was a big deal, we are here led to understand that drinking of the cup which represents the blood of Jesus Christ unworthily is the wanton wasting of the blood of Jesus Christ. Pause here for a moment and think on what it is when Jesus Christ has died so that we can have the forgiveness of sins, and so that we can have victorious living, and so that we can have fellowship with God and one another, think what a wanton waste of the blood of Jesus Christ, sin in the life of a believer, then is. 
and it becomes a serious matter. And so the Passover and the participation of the Passover is one that sobers us to the reality of what sin in the life of a believer is after such a great sacrifice and shedding of blood has been made so the opposite could take effect. And so we ought to take it very seriously. And ought to be preparing ourselves to take it very seriously. Verse 28 then, the result after having been guilty of the body and blood of the Lord, the result is this, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I love the privilege of self-examination. Don't you? I love the privilege of being able to judge ourselves so that we would not be judged. You'll be judged if you remain out of fellowship and if you uh, stay in sin. But friend, if you take the opportunity to consider that you're out of fellowship and to get forgiveness <coughs> for sin... You'll be back into fellowship and you'll be partaking worthily rather than unworthily. To partake unworthily is dangerous. Very dangerous. Now here's where Christians sometimes get off and, and uh, go the wrong direction. And they embrace the wrong mindset which is, I'd better not take a chance of participating in the Lord's Supper unworthily because it could be dangerous for me. And they don't consider that living in sin is dangerous for them. The whole point is not, uh, don't partake unworthily if you're in sin, so don't partake. The whole point is, don't be unworthy. Amen. Get right. Get back in fellowship with God. Now, I've warned people many times, and I will warn again this evening, don't participate in the Lord's Supper unworthy, unworthily. I'm not pressuring you to participate in the Lord's Supper this evening. But it's dangerous for you to not be able to participate in the Lord's Supper this evening. Do you see it from the Scripture? Scripture is not herein declaring that uh, it's better not to participate if you're out of fellowship and so don't participate. It's saying it's bad to be out of fellowship. And it's dangerous to participate when you're out of fellowship. So get in fellowship. And the so statement or the purpose statement is what's most important about it, isn't it? Get in fellowship is the point of it. And boy, what a wonderful thing to have a checkup every now and again. Amen. Melissa and I last week bought a scale because ours was broken. That's good to have a bathroom scale. Just know where you're at. It's a little bit of a motivator. Know where you're at. That's good to get on it. Even if you don't want to get on it because it tells you the truth. And you know something? It's good to have the Lord's Supper. It's good. It's, it's, it, it, the illustration falls short, we understand. But it's good to have the Lord's Supper because it, it kind of just tells us, hey, go ahead and get a checkup. Go ahead and find out what's going on. Find out if things have gotten bad. And find out just exactly where things are. And examine yourself. That's what the Bible says, self-examination. And then it further goes on to say in verse 31, if we would judge ourselves... We should not be judged. Now, verse 32, when we are judged, we're chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And again, that's the follow-up of that statement I made a minute ago. You make the determination, oh, I better not participate in the Lord's Supper because I'm unworthy. I've judged myself unworthy. Well, then, get right. Get in fellowship. First, what John 1, 9. If we confess it, well, Pastor, I'm not sure I want to give up my sin. Get real about it. Get real about your sin because the Bible here says that if we would not judge, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. It doesn't say, well, if you judge yourselves, you're not going to be judged. You're not going to be judged anyway. No, you will be judged. And the Bible says that when we're judged, we're chastened of the Lord. It's coming if you don't get right. Chastening's coming. God's going to deal with you. And so take advantage of the opportunity to self examine so that God doesn't examine because when God examines you, you'll be judged. When you examine yourself, you get to slide in underneath the whole if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Chastening cleanses us, my friend, but what really cleanses us is the sacrifice of the blood of the cross on the cross of Jesus Christ. And we get to just have the substitution where Jesus Christ died for our sin kick in and take effect rather than our having to be chastened for our sin. And a believer who's out of fellowship will, will endure chastening. You'll undergo chastening. 
as a result. And so in verse 33, wherefore my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. So don't put each other first, tarry one for another. You'll see this evening that as well as we know how, we try to follow the example of this by our men serving, first of all, you in the church. And so they serve the elements to you, the bread and the juice or the wine, which is the fruit of the vine. And as they serve you, uh, they are tarrying or waiting for you. And then as they come back forward, they'll serve me, and then I'll serve them. And the idea is wait for everybody. And then it isn't everybody that gets it just goes ahead and partakes in the elements. We wait for each other and we partake at the same time. Why is that? Well, so no one has preeminence. So everybody's the same. They don't serve. Oh, they get served first. They get served the big cup, and this one gets served the little cup, and they get served the quality bread. They get served the less quality. No, it's the same for everybody, and it's at the same time for everyone. And then in verse 34, if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. And it would be nice to hear that, but we're not privy to the things that we don't need to hear about. We heard about what we need to hear about this evening, and so now it's time to participate in the elements of the Lord's Supper. So we're going to ask our men to come at this time. If you guys